Um, good evening. I'm Miles. How you doing? Let's see your Bibles. Let's see the Word of God. Word. Ooh. No pain. I got two pains. I got two hands. <laughs> Next week we'll be here. Next week we'll be here. Two weeks we'll be at Golden Hall. We'll all be together. And there's only one evening service, so the five o'clock service will be with us. So we'll have a and I hope you're praying for a supermarket, Kmart, Vons that closed down or something like that. I pray that the one in your neighborhood shuts down and we can take it over. <laughs> Go out of business. Um, we need 75,000 square feet, which is like a supermarket with a strip mall next to it, and then 1,000 or 1,200 parking spaces. So if you're driving around, you see this big supermarket or Kmart or something even bigger, like a big warehouse and a big parking lot, and it's for sale or going out of business or the condemned, call our office. We'll uncondemn it. <laughs> Amen? We'll convert it. Oh... Yeah, if you have a cell phone or a pager, please turn it off. I appreciate it. Okay, Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. By now, all of you have seen on tele... Oh, I think John talked about the new book. The new book. If you want to get a copy, I'll be in the bookstore. Uh, for many years, I've been asked questions by many parents, what to do with their parent, their kids. Their kids are in this trouble, this kind of trouble, this kind of trouble. And I wanted to write one book that would help all those parents, no matter what your kids are going through. And this book is going to help you understand the spiritual battle that your kid is in, no matter what they're going through. Now, if you have been a wild child, or you are a wild child, you need to buy this for your parents. Okay, if you know somebody who's a wild child, who has a wild child, buy this for them, and I'll be in a bookstore after. And all the money that that you spend for the book goes to the church. I don't get any of that money, so just so for whatever that's worth. Okay, all of you seen on television the videotape of those police officers kicking that guy in the ground. Everybody see that? If you didn't see, it's about I don't know, 10, 20 cops kicking this guy in the ground. He has been shot five times. And he stole a police car, and uh, he, I think he bit a cop. They're not sure if he shot a cop. But make a long story short, they're kicking him, and the, the videotape is from the helicopter, and they're all kicking him, and it's, it, it's, uh, it's crazy. Well, I saw a video of a kid getting initiated into a gang here in San Diego in El Cajon going through that same thing. His gang members or future gang members that he was joining were kicking him, punching him, elbowing him and the kids on the ground rolling around but you can see the kids see in the video on television you couldn't see the guy on the ground because he was surrounded by so many cops you, you couldn't even see him but this videotape that I saw was a kid on the ground and the, and the camera was on ground level so you could see the guy getting beat and they're punching punching and punching and kicking him and they were initiating him into the gang now what's ironic about it is that when you join a gang well here's, here's what you're doing you are joining a group of people. And once you join, your chances of getting arrested and going to jail go up. Your chances of dying before you're 25 go up. Your chances of being a, a, a target of other gang members goes up. Your chances of not finishing school or, or, or college go down. You, nothing good. And what they want you to do is they say, listen, we are going to ruin your life. And, in it, and for you to join this elite group and have this great career opportunity, your initiation is we want to beat you up. <laughs> that is so crazy. Backwards. Okay, let me think about this now. I think that sounds like a good plan. <laughs> Why don't I pay you? At the, since we're at it, I'll give you some money so I can join. I've talked many years about uh, I've talked many sermons, hundreds, about the benefits of being a Christian. Peace, joy, love, patience, kindness. You get forgiven of your sins. You go to heaven. You walk with God. God speaks to you, blah, 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 blah. Brings great people into your life. But there's another side to it. The other side to it is that you become a target of people. In, the, in other words, all your pain is not going away. 
or your hard times is not going away. Once you step over the line and say you're with Christ, there comes trials that you will get just because you're a Christian. If people know it, by the way, you have to be living it. People are going to attack you. People are going to hate you. People are going to come against you. People are going to label you. I was speaking in Connecticut for a, a friend of mine uh, who was a coach of mine when I was in college. And I had gotten saved. I went back and spoke at his high school where he was a coach and did assembly and did this. And he said, Miles, can you not tell people that you're an evangelist? I said, why not? He says, because when people think of evangelists, they think of a crook. They think of a bad guy. I said, well, listen, I'm going to have to reverse that because that's what I am. That's what I'm going to have to say. But that's part of the deal. So when you get saved, don't think, well, all my problems are going away. Everything's going to be fine now. You're going to have power to deal with that trials. You're going to be taught and improve if you trust in God. You are going to grow as a Christian through those bad times. But the bad times are going to come. And don't think it's strange. As a matter of fact, there's a verse in the Bible we're going to read. That when stuff happens to you, how could this be happening to me? You're one of God's kids. You're one of God's kids, and the enemy is the devil. He don't like you. Matter of fact, in my book, one of my first points I make to these parents is that when your kid's messing up and doing all that kind of stuff, your child is not the enemy. The devil's the enemy. It's bigger than you and your child. It's bigger than you and that person. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against the principalities and the darkness. So if you're not getting a raise, you're not getting a promotion, it's not about you and your boss. It's about you, God, and Satan. It's the spiritual battle. So that's what, that's what, that's what um, we're going to look at today is that Paul, when Paul was saved, Saul was saved, he was warned, hard times are coming. Let's look at verse, verse uh, 15. Now, before we do this, I'm going to do a little review. What book are we studying? The book of? And it's the Acts of the who? And uh, the person we're studying, he, he was, last week he was saved. His name is Paul. We know him as Paul. But before it was Paul, his name was? Okay, when he was saved, he was on his horse, Jesus appeared to him in a bright light, knocked him to the ground, he was blinded, and God called the disciple to go pray for him. That disciple's name started with an A, it is? Very good, say Ananias. It's a different Ananias from the one that got struck dead with his woman Sapphira, where they lied about the money, remember that? Okay, well, yeah, okay, that was a while ago, some of y'all might not have been here. But, verse 13, it says in Acts 9, 13, Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many things about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. What God told Ananias is go pray for Saul. And Ananias is saying, God, don't you know about this dude? And God says, I'm God. Verse 15, the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Listen, Paul, I want your life. You're going to preach for me, but you're also going to suffer. That's just the way it is. You're going to preach for me, but you're also going to suffer. You are going to live a life of sacrifice. When you give your life to Christ, let me tell you something. You have no more rights. You give them to God. What do I mean by that? If God wants you to be poor, you're going to be poor. If God wants you to be rich, you'll be rich. If God wants you to be, you know, wherever you are now, God wants you to have three cars, no cars, ride the bus, walk, that's what it is. Complain to God all you want. Complain to God all you want. God is God. So he said, Paul, here's my life I have for you. Now, Saul, you can rebel against me and you can walk away from me. That's your prerogative. But I'm going to challenge you to follow me by faith. And the path that I'm going to lead you on is going to have a lot of pain in it. That don't sound like a good deal. But here's what Paul's deal is. Paul's saying, Paul realizes that I've done life my own way. And guess what? I've never been satisfied. And so I will walk with you, God, wherever you lead me. Jesus is looking for those kind of saints. See, too many of us, a little, little something happens and we go running away. I, I, I don't want to go. I don't want to believe that stuff anymore because we want to be everything, to be comfortable. Let me tell you something. Jesus died. Jesus died. So whenever you have a little, little, little problem, a little thing under your fingernail trial, I want you to think about Jesus' death. Turn to, you're in the book of Acts, right? The next book is Romans. Turn to Romans, and after that is 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians, and after that is 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians. We're going to be in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 
2 Corinthians chapter 11. Listen to those pages turn. There you go. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Now, whenever you read in the Bible, Romans, that's a letter that Paul wrote to the people in Rome or an epistle. Everybody say epistle. An epistle is a letter. It's a letter. Paul wrote a letter to the Christians in Rome. That's Romans. The Corinthians is he wrote a letter, an epistle to the people in Corinth. This is the second letter. It'd be like me writing a letter to you. It, it, we would call it the San Diegans. Okay, that would be the name of the letter, San Diegans. Okay, this is Corinthians. Philippians is a letter to the people in Philippi. Ephesians is a letter to the people in Ephesus. Okay, this is the second letter. And look what Paul says in verse 24 of chapter 11. This is amazing. It says he's talking about the trials that he experienced. 1124 says, from, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. When Jesus was crucified, they whipped him 39 times. 40 times was a death penalty. They whipped him 39 times. Paul says, I did that. I had that done to me five times. When's the last time someone whipped you 39 times? Never. Five times? How many times are you think, man, I, I don't, I don't want to be saved anymore. I'm not, I'm not a Christian. I don't know, Jesus. I don't know what you're talking about. Five times. 39, that is, how many lashes? 195 lashes. Look what it says in verse 25. Three times I was beaten with rods. You seen Rodney King get beat with rods? Happened to him three times. It says, once I was stoned. Now, when you stone somebody, you pick up the biggest rock you can find, and you throw it on them until they are dead. I mean, once is enough for that. Imagine he's on the bottom of his rocks and he's getting stoned and they think he's dead. They walk away. And somewhere he gets the strength to, to fight his way through these rocks. That's what happened to him. That brother had, must have had broken bones, scars all over his back, scars all over his face. Look what it says. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep like Elian Gonzalez overnight in the water. In journeys often, verse 26, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren. This brother was in perils. <laughs> verse 27, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, in cold and nakedness. How many times do we complain about this stuff? I'm hungry. I don't want to go to church. I want to go to Denny's. I'm sleepy. I don't want to get up. I'm tired. Oh, you know, I, I just had a hard week. I'll skip church this week. This was this guy's life. It was his life. Look what it says in verse 28. Beside the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. In other words, you know what he's saying? He's saying, I deal with all this stuff, but I carry around daily my burden and love for all of y'all. And not only one church, but the church in Corinth, church in Ephesus, church in Philippi, church in Rome. He's writing letters, correcting them, encouraging them, going there, encouraging them, and he's getting beat up a whole way. A thankless job, arrested in prison. This is Paul. You know what God said? I want you to come serve me. But here's what it's going to be like. See, many of us will walk away from that kind of commitment. That's the kind of commitment Jesus wants. When he asks you, to, when he asks you to, for salvation, he's saying, if you come to me, whatever I do, is there a blessing side? Yeah, you can get all the other CDs and listen to all the blessings. Today is the bad side. But it's not really bad. It's not really bad because you know what? Defeat, if you will, trials and hard times is all about growing. I was watching the, 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 the Olympic trials today, and I love sports with a passion. I think it's the greatest thing. It's just great to see people compete. 
And I always, get, I always start crying when I see that people win and lose. And like Jackie joined the law. She didn't make the Olympics. And Marion Jones won. I don't know if you know Marion Jones. But, um, and, and this other lady, uh, Regina Jacobs, going to be 37 years old. And she won the 1,500-meter race. She's going to be 37. Another woman made the Olympics in the same race, 1,500 meters. She's blind. She's legally blind. She was in the, para, uh, uh, the Special Olympics, but she can see images. She can't see like we can, but she sees images. And she's a very tall woman. And she, up to the race, she couldn't even run. They were getting ready to start the race, and she couldn't even warm up. Her, her legs and knees were hurting her so bad. She almost dropped out. She runs the race, and all she could see is images in front of her. And in the middle of the race, she almost tripped. She stumbled and almost fell down, and she made the Olympics. And she's talking about, it. I'm like, boom. you know what? Fighting. F and some people lost. Girl, 17 years old from Morris High School, was in the finals for the 400 meters. I don't know if you saw that. 17 years old. And she, 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 she went to the finals but didn't make the Olympics. And she was bummed, 17. She's got time. But you know what? When they get in, when you join a sporting group, a team, you know that defeat and disappointment is part of the process. But the prize is so good. The prize is so rewarding that it's worth the process. Amen? So when Jesus, when he told Paul, Paul, you want to come? You want to come with me? He says, there's going to be trouble. People are going to be against you. It ain't all going to be smooth. Paul says, I'm sold out. Jesus wants to know who wants to be sold out. Because what he has out there for you and me is going to require someone who's strong, someone who's got courage, and someone who's got guts. Not no punk. Not a punk. Turn to... Um, uh, uh, verse 7, right where you're at. Chapter 12, verse 7. When you go through trials, first let me say this. Let me qualify trials. When you go through bad times, always go through bad times because, and, and, and these principles only apply if you're going through bad times because you're godly. And what I mean by that, Matthew 5.10 said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Not just to persecute. In other words, if you lose your job, you may lose your job because you're not doing your job. <laughs> you know, did it ever dawn on you? <laughs> you know, maybe people are talking about you because you're a hypocrite. Ever dawn on you? So don't think, well, I'm just a Christian and I don't deserve this. No, sometimes you deserve it. In any case, God is going to use it in your life. But the Bible says here, blessed, happy, abundantly provided for an overabundance spiritually are those people who are persecuted because they are, they are persecuted because they're representing Christ. In other words, you're representing Christ and people are coming against you and you're still going. God says like this to you. That's right. He's cheering. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Benny go went into the fire, you know God was cheering. That's right. Those are my boys. And he sent his angel down, said, don't let them get burnt. His angel was Jesus. The, son, the, the angel of the Lord, that's Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, went into the fire. And the Bible says their clothes didn't even smell like fire. Whoo! Imagine being in the fire. The flames are burning. Your hands flowing in the flames. And you ain't burnt. So I check this out. I ain't burnt. My smoke's not even on my hands. Not. They must have been tripping. And then they saw Jesus in there. Don't worry. Don't worry. And then Nebuchadnezzar says, come on out. I would have been like, no, you come in. <laughs> you got to be persecuted for Jesus' name. But you know what Nebuchadnezzar said? If you don't, if you don't bow to me, I'm going to throw you in the fire. You know what they says? Our God can deliver us. And then they said, even if we die, because Christians die because of their faith. They don't lose. When you die, you're with the Lord. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, even if we die, we're not going to bow. We stand strong. So don't think Jesus is going to deliver you every time. He'll deliver you spiritually. He ain't, gonna, he ain't necessarily going to deliver you uh, from disappointment. Verse 7, when you go through trials, your power is going to be increased. Let me read this to you. Verse 7, Paul in 12.7, Paul had just seen a vision. He had seen an incredible vision. And in verse 7, he says, lest I should be exalted above measure or become proud 
by the abundance of the revelation or visions. A thorn in my flesh or pain was given me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, to humble me, lest I be exalted above measure. And concerning this pain, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might be removed from me. And look what God said. First, let me back up. Paul's been through all of this stuff. Paul's preaching the gospel. Paul is being used by God in a mighty way. And he says, God, please take this pain away from me. And here's what God says. My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Basically, no, not yet. What? I'm not going to church anymore then. I'm not reading my Bible anymore. Forget you, God. Where are you going to go? Who are you going to trust? There ain't going to be Ghostbusters. <laughs> There's nowhere you can go. There's no way you can get any, what I can give you, Saul. So just be quiet. They didn't have this conversation because Paul didn't back talk to him. But when you say that, God's like, where are you going to go? You going to go get high? Go ahead. You'll be back. You going to go have sex with somebody? Go ahead. You'll be back. And you know what? You'll be back with more problems. He said, my grace, my supernatural, unconditional love and encouragement and provision for everything you need. Not what you want, but everything you need, that's all you need. Get used to it. This is what Jesus wants. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask some of y'all to get saved. You're going to say, man, am I getting saved to that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what you're getting saved to? You're getting saved to total forgiveness, total transformation, and you're getting saved to whatever God wants. But you're getting saved knowing this, that God loves you and that God is going to give you his crumbs are better than the devil's delicacy. That's what you're getting saved to. God, I know that whatever you do is going to be better than what I got. That's why. Now, do you live a life of getting beat up like this? Probably not in this country. If you were in the Sudan, yes. If you were some other place in the world, yes, where people are getting killed and persecuted physically for their faith, it probably won't happen to you here. You may get talked about a little bit. You may get gossiped on a little bit. You may get criticized a little bit, but that's nothing. That's nothing. Turn to Philippians. Look at that. 2 Corinthians, and after that is Galatians, and then Ephesians, and then Philippians. Turn to Philippians. Philippians. Three books back. Philippians chapter 3, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. This is a letter to the people in Philippi, the church in Philippi. As a matter of fact, the letter says, Paul and Timothy, a bondservant, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. Very first verse, that's what it says. Okay, so we're in chapter 3, verse 7. And look what Paul says. Paul was bragging about how popular and how powerful he was as a Jew. And he says in verse 7, but what things were gained to me, I have counted a loss for Christ. Verse 8, yet indeed I count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as garbage that I may gain Christ. You know what Paul's saying? He is all my Diploma, my degrees, my diploma, my accolades, my fame in the Christian faith and, and in Judaism, I'm a Pharisee. I studied under the best Pharisee. It's all trash compared to knowing Jesus. Your job, your career, your dot com, your stock, trash compared to knowing Jesus. It's trash. It's all going to burn up. And it's all going to burn up. A friend of mine works in Wall Street and uh, she's selling bonds and she said miles you have no idea how much money is out there and how much money i'm making especially now with the economy the way it is her boss she says my boss has a jeweler that comes to the office all the time trying to sell him diamonds and the jeweler came up with all these tennis bracelets and diamond rings necklaces and he said he just bought he spent 33 grand for his wife just like that just on and so she was tripping and she said uh next day how'd your wife like it and the guy said, well, it was, you know, it was okay. What? Man, if my wife didn't start crying, I'm taking that back to the store. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? $33,000? One, I wouldn't do it. But two, 30, <laughs> that's a whole lot of money, Joe. <laughs> I mean, I can't do it. But uh, if I had it, I'd be like, yo, baby, you can get a picture. Get some... <laughs> <laughs> I can get some good cubic for 3000 you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but anyway, 
He spent 33 grand, his wife, and I wasn't there, but from his expression, like, oh, it's, it's okay. It's garbage. Now, I, don't know that, I don't know that that was her reason, but it's nothing. It's nothing. When we go to heaven, the streets are going to be gold. Y'all spend money for that stuff. It's concrete. <laughs> You're going, oh, look at that gold. Let me spend 20. It's like, God's like, why are you buying that? It's on the ground. Look what Paul says. So I try to tell my wife, it's garbage, Debbie. You don't want it. You don't want any. <laughs> it's in the Bible. Look, it's in the Bible. <laughs> I'm so blessed. My wife, my wife, and she'll be embarrassed. She's not here. She's out of, my whole family went out of town. Uh, I'm home by myself. Don't awe me. I, <laughs> I was walking around my house. Oh, but thank you. I was walking around my house the first night they left, walking in the bedrooms of my kids. I was crying. And I called my wife up and said, Dad, I said, they're going to be gone. We're going to be here by ourselves. Isn't that going to be so great? <laughs> That's not what I said there. I just said it was really sad. It was really sad. But I'm in my house uh, um, by myself. My wife... You know, she's not a jewelry person. She don't wear any makeup. Never wore makeup a whole life that we met her. She just naturally got it going on. So I'm blessed. I used to date a makeup queen. Uh, nothing wrong with being a makeup queen, not at all. But, you know, she just, I'm glad she ain't into that. Diamonds and golds and expensive stuff. She prefers houses and cars and pools. You know? <laughs> Verse 8, I counted all a loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as garbage that I may gain Christ. Look what it says in verse 9. And be found, I want to, when people find me, I want to be in him, abiding, trusting in him, <clears throat> not having my own righteousness, which is from the law. What does that mean? Is that when you do right things, you feel like I'm somebody, I'm a good person because I never killed anybody? He's like, I don't want that kind of righteousness. Because I'm always going to do something wrong. He says, Lord says, I'll not my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness which is from God by faith. When you ask Christ to be your savior, he cleanses you and he gives you his righteousness. I have Jesus' righteousness, not because I do everything perfect, but because by faith I have received his Holy Spirit. His righteousness. And when God the Father looks at me, he says, that's my righteous son. Not my perfect son, but my forgiven son. My redeemed son. My son that I'm going to never leave or forsake. And I'm going to continue to encourage no matter what happens. My son, I'm going to love through thick and thin. That's the righteousness you want to have before God. You don't ever want to come to God and say, God, I'm perfect. I did everything right. Because God will say, you did. You did. Let me roll the tape. <laughs> and it's the tape of all the stuff you think about. Amen. Not the stuff you do. So let's just start with that. Oh, I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> but look what it says. Verse uh, 10. That I may know him. Everybody say know him. And the power. Everybody say power. Of his resurrection. Say of his resurrection. The power that raised him from the dead. Paul says, I want to know that. Now, when he says, I want to know it, let me tell you what he's not saying. I don't want to know about it. I want to know it. Everybody say the word in the Greek. It's called gnosko. Say gnosko. Very good. Say gnosko. Gnosko means to know something through experience. When I went, on a, I went on a fast a while ago and I was on day 30 of my fast and I bought a juicer on day 30. I was so excited to get this juicer because I wanted to drink. Yeah, I, just, I never had a juicer, so I was like, man, this is going to be good. So I went to the store, and I bought every vegetable that they had, stuff I never heard of. I was just going, bam, 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 bam. And I'm a, kind of a compulsive, compulsive, addictive, type A-driven personality. So if I get, can you tell? If I get... <laughs> <laughs> Y'all like, duh. If I, if I get like, oh, I'm going to do this, I just like, you know, kill it. So I went to the grocery store. I'm like, 
157 pounds. I'm all skinny looking like I'm going to die. I hadn't eaten in a month. And I'm walking in there like this. <laughs> and I'm like, I want all your vegetables. I got all these vegetables. I'm walking out. And I'm all jacked up. Got my juicer. Went home. And I put all, every vegetable I had in this juicer. Wham, 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 wham. A whole beets. Uh, potatoes, uh, 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 string beans, peas, carrots, like everything. I got an onion. I cut a quarter of an onion I put it in there. I'm like, rah, rah. my wife's looking at me like, you are so stupid. <laughs> so stupid. <laughs> so ignorant. <laughs> and I'm like, Debbie, I'm, I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to be healthy. This stuff is going to get me good. And I'm pouring all stuff. And I, rah, 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 and I pour it into the cup. Whoosh, bubbles are coming out, smoking. Stuff is growing out of the top. You know, it's like, yeah, this is, this is power. This is, this is God. This is Discovery Channel drink. This right here. So I took it. <laughs> I was going crazy. And I gulped this thing down. Bam, 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 bam. It was running down my face. I was like, ah, ah. And my wife's like, <laughs> my wife's so opposite me because I'm like so like this, and my wife's like this. <laughs> I come home, my mom telling her what happened. She's like, <laughs> so. I mean, she doesn't say so, but she's like, uh, can you get the mail? <laughs> you know. So I drink this. Boom, 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 boom. Now, I haven't eaten in a month. So my body's like, excuse me? <laughs> we are having a vacation down here, and we don't have nothing to do with all the stuff you just say. This stuff went into my body, went into my blood, went throughout my body within like 15 seconds. I'm not lying. My skin opened up. I was sweating. Sweat was like, my eyes started tearing. My nose was running. My ears were bleeding. I was like, I mean, I, I thought I was going to blow up. <laughs> My body said, we can't handle this. <laughs> I gnosko those vegetables. <laughs> you know what Paul says? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Paul says, I want to gnosko Jesus. I want his power to be all up in my business. I want to see stuff that happens. I was laying on my floor this morning. <laughs> thinking about power, God's power, and how I want God to move. And I said, God, I know I don't. God was telling me, you don't know anything about my power. You know only this much. That much. He says, do you want to know this much? I was like, yeah. Do you really, really want to know this much? Yeah. Okay, let's go. But you got to leave all that behind. Stuff that I thought was okay. You got to come with me. I was like, this is going to be a trip. I was in a bad neighborhood yesterday. Driving around. Looking at people. Praying for people. I saw this guy walking down the street. I'm not going to say he was a wino. But the whites of his eyes weren't red. They were almost black. And he was, his lips were black from, I guess, smoking. He just looked a mess. I said, hey, man, what would you think about a church being in this place, in this neighborhood? He goes, this is a terrible place for a church. <laughs> I was like, let me get a tape recorder out. This is going to be real funny. I mean, he, first he, I called him. And he looked at me like, yeah, you know. I was like, no, come here, man. He was like, hey, what? 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 <laughs> this is just, just I was having a one of my little moments alone, I said, look, man, what do you think about church in this place? He's like, man, this is a terrible place. He said, you got drugs over here. You can buy all the drugs you want in that park. The police over here. You got this over here. He says, first, you got to clean up the community. Then bring the church. I was like, fella, that's the purpose of the church. <laughs> ah, yeah. And I was like, God, I, don't, I, don't, I want to make a difference somewhere. Let's show me what you want me to do. Some of y'all in here, y'all, y'all, a lot of y'all know Jesus. You got to say, God, show me 
What do you want me to do? Change me, use me. I want to see all the power. I'm not going to complain about these little things happening in my life. I realize that these trials are for my good. They're going to help me leave behind some of my, my issues. I want to be used. I want to be powerful in the Lord, in the Lord. But some of y'all in here, you need to be saved. You need to realize today Jesus wants to forgive you, cleanse you, clean and yes, you are going to step over the line into the unknown. The unknown is that you're putting yourself in the arms of God, a loving, caring, 24-7 God. Is your life going to go to pot? No, it's going to be blessed more than ever before. The Bible says that God leads you through the valley of shadow of death, not into it and leaves you. He doesn't leave you there. How many of you ever caught hell before? You ain't heard that expression, I caught hell. Well, you know, bad things have happened. You know, I heard a song yesterday. He says, listen, when you catch hell... Don't hold on to it. <laughs> let it go. Let it go. How do you let it go? As you grab onto Jesus. There was a guy hanging from a branch on a cliff, a thousand feet above rocks, yelling for help. Jesus walks over to the cliff and looks down at him and says, yeah, can I help you? He says, duh, lift me up. And Jesus says, I can help you, but you got to do one thing. He said, what? Uh, let go of the branch. See, I can't help you until you let go. You don't, you, don't, you don't go from having control of your life to now having control of God. God has control of you. And when God has control of you, he leads you places you don't know. He tells you to do stuff you don't understand. He tells you things you never heard. He conforms you and transforms you into something you would have never thought to do on your own. That's the beautiful thing about working with God. But you know the devil's against you? He's nothing. He's a little worm. He can't do anything to you unless God allows it and God knows exactly how far to push you. That's the sweet thing about God. You know, when I got on a plane, I, I was at a, on a, in the airport Monday morning last week. I had to leave to go to New Orleans to do a book thing for this book. And I was sitting in the airport, 7.30 in the morning. I was mad because 7.30 in the morning on Monday, I am tired. <laughs> Not tired, tired. And I'm sitting there going, why am I here? I'm the only one in the airport. Why do I got to be here so early? And I'm sitting there talking to Larry, who does the announcements. Sometimes up here, and, and this woman was looking at us. And so Larry saw her before I did, and he thought she was kind of, you know, checking her brother out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he didn't know her, so he didn't know what she was doing. But she kept looking, looking, looking. So then I sat down, and she comes walking right over. There's nobody else around. She's walking like on a mission. So I jump up. How you doing? Boom, boom. She said, are you miles? She's grinning. She's all happy. She said, I've been to your church. Blah, 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 blah. And then after about a minute, she goes, I want to be saved. I was like, excuse me, sit down. You have come to the right place. You knocked on the right door. She said, but I'm at work. I said, don't worry, take a break. Let's sit down. She got saved. You know, she realized, boom, whatever God wants, I'm ready. In a minute, we're going to pray. And if you pray to ask Jesus Christ in your life, you have to realize one thing, whatever God wants. He's going to forgive you. He's going to fill you with his spirit. He's going to own you. He's going to own you. He bought you with his blood when he died on the cross. He bought me. He bought us. He did it in love. And so by faith, you have to voluntarily say, Jesus, I'm ready to be purchased. And you grab him and you let him do to you what he did to that little kid that you saw tonight. Change you. You know that little kid's going to get talked about at school? And you know that little kid's relationship with Jesus is going to enable him to go, Psh! teachers are going to, not like him because he's going to speak up in class against evolution. And he's going to go, Psh! he's going to quote scripture to him. They're going to bring him into the office. They're going to tell him he can't do that. And he's going to go, Psh! and he's going to come home. Mom, guess what happened? Mom, dad, guess what happened? And you know what? When that kid gets 18 years old, he's going to have a church somewhere. I don't know. I'm just, he's going to be doing something. The devil's going to come after him, come after him. But he knows greater is he who's in him, Jesus, than he who's in the world, Satan. So when you give your life to Christ, you're saying, Lord, I'm ready to step over the line and trust you with my life. For the rest of you, here's my challenge to you. I want you to define what the one thing that's scaring you away from being obedient. In other words, God's calling you to be obedient, and the only reason you're not is because you're scared of something. You're scared of rejection. You're scared of getting talked about. You're scared of failing. Let me tell you something. There's nothing to be scared of except fear itself. You don't even need to fear it. 
You just need to say, God, I'm going. So let's all bow our heads and pray. Lord, I thank you so much for love and loving us and offering us eternal salvation, eternal security, eternal forgiveness. I thank you that even in the darkest times, your light is still as bright as it ever is. Your love is still as strong as it ever is. And Lord, I thank you even now there are people out there whose hearts are beating just like Devon's was. They're scared because they're going to surrender their life to you and they're not sure what's going to happen. But they do know that it's the right thing. They do know this is what they've been looking for. And they do know that it's going to be the best decision that they will ever make. If you realize that you are a sinner, you realize Jesus died for your sin and rose from the dead. You realize it's time for you to surrender your life to him and step over the line and surrender your life to him and ask for his forgiveness. I want you to pray this prayer with me. You may be going through a hard time right now and you need to surrender your pain to him, your fears and your doubts to him. I want you to pray this prayer with me. But as you pray, you must realize that you are leaving your old life behind. In the privacy of your heart, pray, dear God, I believe that I am a sinner, that my sin is wrong, that it will kill me, send me to hell. I don't want to go to hell. I want to be forgiven. I want to be saved. Dear Jesus, please forgive me. Cleanse me. Take over my life. Be my Savior and my Lord. Take my burdens and my fear. Give me hope. A hope that will never die. And please never leave my side. Thank you, Jesus. As all of our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you prayed that prayer to ask Jesus to be your Savior, right now as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet right now in this place. If God has spoken to you and you have answered him by asking him to forgive you, God bless you. Stay standing, please. Stand to your feet and surrender your life to him right now in this place. Anybody else? God bless you. Good. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Good. God bless you. God bless you. There is no reason to wait. This is why you were born. Why you were created was right here. That you can give your life to your creator. Anybody else? Stand to your feet. And acknowledge Christ as your Savior. Anybody else? God has spoken to you. Do not deny him. Do not put it off. Do not wait. Anybody else? God bless you. Good. Good. God bless you. Stay standing, please. Very good. Anybody else? God bless you. You're not going to worry about what's going to happen. You trust God. God bless you. Good. Good. Anybody else? Why do you think your heart's pounding? Because God is trying to love you. Your heart is saying, this is it. Don't walk away. Don't pass this up. This is it. Do it. Anybody else? Stand to your feet. Good. Good. Very good. Very good. Now I'm going to ask all you to do one more thing. And if you did not stand and you need to, I want you to stand. If you prayed that prayer to ask Christ into your heart, we're going to ask you right now to come up out of your seat right down here to the altar as we welcome you to the family of God. Step out of your seat and come on down here right now. Come on. Come on. God bless you. Stay right there. God bless you. You face this way. God bless you. Good. Come on. Come on. Come on. Walk out of your seat. Come on down here. Come on. God bless you. God bless you. It's a great day. Nothing to be ashamed of. This is a great day. 
Stay right there. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Come on. Come on. Come on down the aisle right now. Come on. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Come on. Congratulations. Very good. Very good. God bless you. Congratulations. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Right now. Right now, all your sin is forgiven. Right now, God is in control. You belong to him now. You don't know Christianity. You can't figure it out. You got to learn it from day one right now. And you have to let him show you the way. Him teach you. Him mold and shape you. But you have to understand this. He knows everything. You don't have to help him out. He knows everything. Amen? Don't try to figure it out for him. Just say, God, here's my life. Here's my life. What do you want to do? And he's going to start to make changes and a whole bunch of stuff. Let him do it. He knows what he's doing. He will never make a mistake. <laughs> he's already got it planned out. And the quicker you obey, the quicker it'll happen. But if you start fighting him, oh, you got problems because you're going to lose. You're going to lose. I love when I wrestle with my kids. I always tell them I'm going to whoop them. And they've been telling me for years, no, you're not. I said, yes, I am. And they go, uh, 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 uh. And I sit there and laugh at them because they can't beat me. They can't beat me yet. When I get old, they, you know, but they can't beat me. You can't beat God. Just let them be God. We're going to pray for you. For all of y'all out there, I want you to pray, what am I scared of? What is stopping me from being obedient? Write it down. I am not being obedient because of this. And look at it, and you'll go, that's all? I'm scared of losing a friend. I'm scared of getting talked about. I'm scared of, of not getting promoted. I'm scared of people talking about laughing at me. That's it? I mean, what else is it going to be? No one's going to whoop you. You're not going to get shipwrecked. You're not going to get beat with rods. That ain't going to happen. So what are you scared of? Oh, you're going to lose your job. You're not going to have money? Psh, come on. I ain't, uh, God got a better job for you. Got a better job for you. Making less money doing more ministry, having more fun. And having more fun. So, so write it down. I am scared because of, I am not being obedient. I'm not walking by faith because of boom, boom, boom. And you'll look at it and you will laugh. Or if you don't laugh, you say, God, can you help me with this? Help me with my unbelief. And God, God will say, that's cool. I can do that. For all y'all, same thing. We want to help you learn the Bible. We want to help you grow. We want to help you get in a small group where you can have people encourage you. So in a minute, we're going to walk that way, and you're going to follow that guy right there with the white shirt that says, Just for Feet. See that guy right there? We're going to look at that guy. You're going to follow him. We're going to take you in the back here. Uh, for the rest of you, uh, if you want to get a book, be back there. If you want to help out with the crusade, there's a little red usher, usher holding a little red bag when you leave. Just drop some money in there if you want. But pray, pray for yourself. We'll be where next week? Right here. Two weeks will be it. Two weeks. Two weeks will be at Golden Home. Lord, we pray for these people. We thank you for them. We thank you for what you're going to do. We thank you for what you have done. We thank you for their faith. Bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you all clap, before you move, all y'all are going to walk that way. Please over here, if you don't move, let them walk down the aisle and get through the aisle. And uh, so let's just walk that way right there. Let's give them a hand.